and you know, see if this might be a path that you might want to be taking in the future as well. So I just want to give you a little bit of background information on physical therapy. So it was developed in 1813. It was founded by Mary McMillan and it was originally called, or the therapists were originally called reconstructive aids. And they were led by nurses with backgrounds in physical education. And they mainly treated uh, wounded soldiers in the first world war. And it only became a common treatment in the outpatient public schools, health centers, and geriatric rehab centers in the late 1950s. So the role of the physical therapist mainly is to make, promote, maintain, and restore health through physical examinations, diagnosis, development in an individualized plan of care, uh, patient education, and implementation of you know, different exercises um, that are individualized to each person. So physical therapy started out as a bachelor's program and then turned into a master's program, which is what I have. I have a master's in physical therapy and now currently is, it is a doctorate program. Um, in terms of salaries, there's no difference. It's all experience-based. So someone coming out with a doctorate may not make more money than someone that has a bachelor's. It's just all based on experience. There's also the physical therapy assistance, and that is an associate's degree, and it's usually a two-year program. So some people choose to go that route. Um, the only difference is, is that the physical therapist can um, examine and change plans of care. Otherwise, physical therapists and physical therapist assistants pretty much do the same thing in terms of treating the patient to maximize their functional outcomes. And the curriculums are all dependent on the school. So they usually consist of a combination of classroom work as well as field work experience. And I feel like most of um, what you learn is out in the fields. And please feel free anytime to ask questions if anybody has any at this point. So the different settings in physical therapy include, but are not limited to this list. Um, the thing with physical therapy is that it is so widespread. You see it in just in ways that you wouldn't think that they would be involved in. Um, and it's just evolved tremendously in what physical therapies um, can be a part of. But the main things that you see them in are the acute care settings like hospitals, inpatient rehab facilities, which is, you know, after someone's been in the hospital, they'll go to an inpatient rehab just for transition. And then you have the home health setting. Then you have outpatient setting that could be adult, pediatric, work hardening. And then you have the skilled nursing facilities which contain short-term and long-term care. And then the school systems. And now we're seeing more telehealth therapy um, where jobs are dedicated solely to telehealth therapists. It's, it's amazing how we're evolving with, especially with this pandemic and adapting to still getting the therapeutic interventions out you know, in a safe manner. And then areas of specialty, again, this is just a list. It's not limited to this list because it's so broad out there. But what, what you'll primarily see in the field is the cardiovascular pulmonary setting, geriatrics, wound management, neurology, orthopedic, pediatrics, recreational sports, women's health, oncology, and work hardening. Now, some settings you'll see all those types of diagnoses. Some are more specific oriented and um, such as like a sports medicine clinic, you may see more just sports injuries. However, some of the outpatient clinics see some of those cardiovascular patients and um, or orthopedic or neurology type um, injuries. So I'm actually going a little faster than I expected. So hopefully you guys will have a lot of questions for me. So my physical therapy journey for me, um, I got involved with therapy because I became a technician during my college years, my undergraduate years at an inpatient rehab. And I just saw um, how the patients reacted to their recovery. It was just amazing seeing the therapist, having the joy of being a part of someone recovering, going from you know, a car accident where they couldn't walk, they had you know, broken bones or whatnot, or even a stroke patient, you know, go from not being able to sit up on the edge of the bed to walking out of the facility. And I, at that time was like, I wanna be a part of that. 
So I pursued um, a physical therapy career. I graduated with a master's in physical therapy from Elon University in May of 2000. Um, I first started out in outpatient and loved it, but, you know, kind of wanted something different and ended up in inpatient rehab, which is where I spent the majority of my career. And um, I felt like that at that setting is where I learned the most um, in terms of a variety of different patients and diagnoses and various pa pop, uh, patient populations. Um, and in the inpatient rehab, I was there so long. I was the physical therapy team lead at the time and I became neurocertified um, and my passion became stroke rehab. Um, where I loved, you know, treating patients with stroke and brain injuries. And like I said earlier, you know, a patient would come in just not even able to sit on the edge of the bed because they would fall over. And then I got them to the point where they were walking out of the building. It's a very rewarding um, profession, I feel like. Um, but during my career at inpatient rehab, I worked PRN um, in a variety of other settings, such as the skilled nursing and the, um, assisted living facilities and home health. And I got some experience in those settings as well. And it's very similar to the inpatient rehab, um, you know, more in the geriatric population, um, still getting everyone to more independence. But, you know, in the last few years, I, you know, after having kids, you know, um, and wanting a schedule very similar to theirs, I kind of pursued an outpatient job in a pediatric clinic and ended up loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it. Um, and then I, you know, pursued a job in the school systems, not only to have the same schedule as my kids, but I love working with the kids in the school system because again, I am helping them succeed in their environmental, I'm sorry, in their educational environment um, and just seeing them thrive and, you know, feel a part of the, you know, the school system. So that's, is my journey. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? I'm going to stop sharing so I could see everybody a little bit better. Um, I know that was kind of fast. <laughs> that was faster than I was expecting, guys. So, I have a question, Jessica. A question. Uh -huh. um, now, you guys probably don't know this, but Jessica works with my daughter um, as her physical therapist and uh, You've been such a huge help to her in the school system, and I really appreciate that. Um, I was wondering, of all the different areas you've worked in, which one did you feel like you were having the biggest impact on other people's lives? Um, I'm definitely going to say inpatient rehab and the schools. I feel like, you know, in the schools, I'm helping the kids be a part of this, their, their environment and feel, you know, part of the general education system. and it's really re rewarding seeing them, you know, walking around, um, participating in gym, even if it's adapted or not adapted. Um, and then in the inpatient rehab part of it, um, you know, with the strokes, like I said, um, just seeing someone go from one end of the spectrum to the other, you know, and then they're going back in the community, being able to do what they used to do. Um, and seeing how it makes the person feel, that's the most rewarding um, part of my, my job as a physical therapist. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm going to definitely say the paperwork is not my most fond part of my job because we do have a lot of it. Um, but the benefits of seeing the smiles on kids' faces or even geriatric patients, the appreciation is what makes me love my job. And knowing hey, that- um... Hey, uh, I have a question. Yes, so, yes. you know, how long does it usually take to work on a patient, just like on average? So it just depends on the setting. Um, if you're, let's start with outpatient, you know, an outpatient clinic. You typically might see someone for two to four weeks, depending on their injury. Um, and then you kind of, at, at, at the end of the 30 days, you kind of reassess, are they making progress? If they're making progress and you still foresee them making progress, you can write a, an order, a, not an order, you can request, you know, an extension um, to continue therapy and then the doctor writes off on it. Typically they, they agree with you and 
you know, let you do that. In inpatient rehab, again, it's the same. It's patient-based and it's also diagnosed diagnosis driven because of Medicare primarily. And Medicare kind of groups patients, which is an unfortunate thing, um, groups patients based on their diagnosis and it becomes a category. So they say, okay, over the last two years, we've noticed that the mean average patient that has had a stroke can recover in this amount of time. So then they kind of allot that time, which is unfortunate for someone like with a stroke just because everyone recovers at different speeds um, and rates of recovery. Um, so that in itself is kind of an unfortunate because some people can recover from a stroke in two weeks. I, when I was starting in rehab, we had all the time in the world we wanted. If we wanted to keep a, a patient, you know, past what they called the RAND, which was the designated um, time frame, they would allow us. But now Medicare has kind of gotten become more sticklers where we don't get that extra time that we used to get. So you have a short time frame, And so you kind of have to pick and choose what your, what your main focus is on. Like, like I said, um, I would have a patient that start out falling over on the mat. We'd have to physically hold them up. And then I would get at least I, back in the day, I had three months to work with these people and they walked out of that building. Now I'm no longer in that setting, but I, I still work PRN occasionally, but they get about approximately two weeks is the average in the inpatient rehab now. And um, so you have to focus on, all right, is my main goal to be able to get them to transfer so they can go from a wheelchair to another chair, like their couch or the commode, um, or is my goal to get them walking? Well, I might choose the transfers first because that's the safest mode of getting around their house and more independently. Because another goal in rehab is to get them home versus, you know, if they're not walking and they're not good at their transfers, then they have to end up going to a skilled nursing facility. And our, we don't want that for them. We want them to get back home. Um, so at, at that point, it'd be, okay, I just want them to be able to transfer to and from different services independently versus focus on the walking where when they get home, they might get the home health aspect of it. And then they can continue to work on just the transfer skills and then getting them walking again, if if that is a feasible goal for that patient. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. Yeah, and then like in the schools, it's different. Um, so we have a preschool program and then we have, um, you know, K through 12. So the preschool program, we can, we have a little more leniency to pick up kids and keep them a little longer. Um, because we're working on those gross motor skills, those foundational sticks, excuse me, skills. But once they hit kindergarten, we're a little bit more limited on keeping students on caseload because it's more of an accessibility issue. It's, you know, is the student able to get from point A to point B, whether it's walking or is it a wheelchair that, that that's their primary mode of locomotion? Um, are they able to sit in the chair efficiently? Are they able to... Um, transition from one place of the school to another, you know, safely and independently. And so if they, if the answer is yes, then typically they don't qualify for, you know, services, but they may qualify for what we call consultation. And um, at that point, they may be primarily wheelchair level, you know, maneuvering in and out of the classrooms and various locations of the school. And we might go in to consult with the teacher on positioning or just making sure the seating that they're in at the at that point in time is appropriate and fitting properly, um, and just giving teachers you know feedback on the safety with transfer techniques to make it easier for the student. So that's for the the school setting. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Any other? It looks like Blake Bailey has a question. Okay. Yeah, so how has COVID affected your job and have you really been able to do much work within the school system? So, I mean, it's affected it a lot. I mean, um, in our profession, um, it's very hard to keep six feet distance just because it requires, you know, transferring, you have to get close to the, the students. Um, and, and again, it also depends on the level of functionality that student is. So, you know, just for instance, a lot of our preschoolers, they, they, they're walking around. So it's easy to um, keep distance with them, but 
their attention span is like less than 30 seconds. So you might have to grab their hand and say, come on, so-and-so, let's go do A, B, and C. And so um, it it has made it more challenging. Um, my, myself, I'm taking super precautions. I double mask um, and, you know, hand wash. And I wear gloves with all my, my students right now, you know, not to protect not only myself, but them as well, because I have 14 of the schools. So I'm going different schools um, throughout the day. Um, I, I have been trying to isolate myself to one school a day, so I'm not going back and forth, but I do take the extra precautions that I need. Um, in terms of virtual, I've been very fortunate with this, my virtual students, because I've got great parents, and a lot of the parents have know the goals that they're working on and have implemented them in the home. So um, in terms of the virtual students have, the parents and the students have done amazing. Um, so in terms of being affected, yeah, it's different, but we're adapting. I think we're making it work based on what we have. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is a little, you know, scarier, but, you know, we're all doing our part and trying to help each other out and trying to prevent the spread of COVID, but we're working it out. Yeah, thank you. Uh-huh. Hey, I have a question. Would, uh -huh. would you differentiate between inpatient and outpatient? I'm not familiar with either of those two terms. Okay, so inpatient. So a lot of times a patient may start in the hospital setting, say they had a stroke or they were in a car accident. They may be in the hospital for a short amount of time and then say that they're just not strong enough to go home yet. So inpatient is another freestanding facility where they stay the night um, overnight and there's nurses, there's doctors and then therapists that are there and it, they're there 24 seven, not the therapists, the nurses and the doctors, um, but the therapists are there just a, a day shift um, where they're primarily focused on rehabilitation. Um, and you know they go to therapy three hours a day, five days a week. Um, and so it's ongoing for about the average two weeks that I told you about. And like I said, some people, recover quicker and they leave quicker than two weeks and some may get a little extra time just because you know they 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 just weren't ready um so after inpatient rehab there's many different directions a patient could go if they're not ready to go home from there and they just met it, uh their insurance won't pay for it anymore they may have to go to a skilled nursing facility um and if at that skilled nursing facility, they have the short-term rehab and the long-term. And so they may go to that short-term first, and then they might find out that they just can't go home anymore. They're just not safe. So then they would trans transition to the long-term part, and that would become their home at that time. Um, but if they go to the short-term and they're great, and they can go home at that point in time, they may end up going home. And then home health might come into play where a therapist comes into the home where they also have nursing and then they do therapy in their home setting just because they aren't able to drive themselves to an outpatient clinic. Um, so they're considered homebound. And then um, outpatient, you don't necessarily have to be in a hospital for that. Say that um, you were jogging one day and you twisted your ankle and you sprained your ankle pretty bad and it swelled up and the, your doctor says, hey, I think therapy would be great for you to work on strengthening. So then you would be referred to an outpatient clinic where you may go once, twice, three times a week based on whatever the therapist has um, thought was appropriate for your care. And you would do that for between two weeks to a month or more, depending on what you needed. Um, but it's a separate clinic that you do not spend the night at. It's just you, you go to and from based on your schedule and the schedule that um, the therapist deems necessary for you. Does that Thank make sense? Yes, it does. Thank uh -huh. you for clarifying. Uh -huh. Anyone else have any more questions? I think our next question is Lazoria. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I was wondering what challenges do you face as a physical therapist? Um, in the school setting, I mean, I don't, 
in the school setting, the challenge that I find is, you know, if a student is just not in the mood to work with me. <laughs> so that can be challenging. You know, kids are kids, teenagers are teenagers, and, you know, they have their moments too. And sometimes they're willing to participate and sometimes they're not. Um, so that's in the school setting. Um, in inpatient rehab, I think one of my challenges was when I said um, the length of stay in Medicare um, mandating only a certain amount of time that a patient could stay there, that's a little frustrating when you're like, if I only had another week with this person, I could get them walking out the door. But you, they, they just put their foot down and they don't allow that. So I feel like in the inpatient setting, that was a biggest challenge for me. Um, in outpatient, <laughs> a challenge for me. And one of the reasons why I kind of didn't stick with it, and there's nothing wrong with it, but you know, some clients would come in and um, you give them a home exercise program because the goal of therapy is to get a, a patient as independent as possible with a home exercise program um, and not rely on us 100%. And um, in the inpatient setting, I think the uh, frustrating point was, so did you do your exercises? Well, no. Well, maybe that's why your pain is still there because you're not doing what we're recommending. That was a big frustration in the outpatient setting um, that I found. Um, now, not every patient was like that, but, you know, there was a handful of them that would do that. And, you know, well, you know, if we don't do our exercises, we're not going to see progress. And, you know, or a patient would be done with therapy, we dismiss them, and then they come back maybe three months later. And um, with the same problem, and you'd be like, well, did you continue your exercises that you were doing? Because, you know, they graduated because they were doing great. They were independent with their home exercise program. They were compliant with it. And like I said, three months later, they come back, well, I stopped doing my exercises. Well, you know, it's a, maybe it's a lifetime commitment and you need to continue this or, you know, you might have these problems. And so that was a challenge in the outpatient setting for me. Thank you. Uh-huh. Could you give us like an example of what kinds of students you would work with or like what, um, like what would you work with them about? So in the school setting? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, I mean, there is a ginormous gamut of diagnoses that we work with. Some are just general developmental delay. We have, um, you know, Down syndrome, mitochondrial um, disorders. Um, cerebral palsy, um, stroke, head injury, brain injury. Um, autism is a big one that we see a lot of. Um, trying to think. It's just a whole game. Those are just a few of them. But, you know, we, we even work with some kids in the gen ed um, settings as well, if, if it's necessary. I think more of the occupational therapists see more of the gen ed kids because of like handwriting issues. Um, so the physical therapy, um, you really have to have a severe physical impairment to um, qualify in the school system. So th those are the types of patients we would see in the school system. Thank but not you. limited to, I'm just going off the top of my head. Did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of my friends who is a physical therapist, uh -huh. they said that, um, there wasn't like a lot of free time for them, um, for most of the time, like when they started working, did that happen? It's like, is that kind of like the majority of physical therapy jobs or is that just for like a certain few? What do you talk about free time? Like, like, uh, um, like not really like be able to like enjoy the weekend or like get a lot of holidays off that type of stuff. I think it depends on the setting. Um, like outpatient, it depends on the clinic. Um, some like the clinics I worked out worked, you know, 10 hour days, Monday through Thursday, and then had a half a day on Friday. Um, and then when I was in assisted living facilities, I kind of got to make my own schedule as long as I worked 32 hours. So I could have worked heavily at the beginning of the week and then be lighter at the end of the week and be done early. Um, and then like inpatient rehab was basically eight to four 30, I believe it was back then. Um, but I did, I was required to work one weekend day a month and I did have to work holidays. It was kind of like a rotational thing. Um, as the team lead at that point in time, I would look, you know, who had what holiday the previous year. And then I tried to make it fair for the other therapists to have that holiday off if they requested it. 
Um, I think it all depends on the clinic you're working at. So that'd be a good question to ask when you look for, you know, if this is a profession you go down, you know, um, you know, definitely ask, you know, what is the vacation time and make sure you know that ahead of time. Um, home health therapists, I know they go into the home and they do have paperwork after hours. So I know I have a friend in home health right now and she'll end up doing paperwork over the weekend, whether it takes her the entire weekend, I don't know. Um, but I do know she has paperwork to do on the weekends. Um, in the school system, that's what, what I love about the school system. I have every holiday off, you know, every um, Christmas break and uh, spring break off with my, you know, kids. It's really nice. And then I have the whole summer off. Um, so it's all setting based and clinic based. So definitely ask that question when you take a job. If, if that's something, yeah. that's, you know. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I mean, I think it's important. I, I hear of people that work, you know, they don't get vacation because they don't have the staff. So that's another question. You know, what's your, you know, what happens if your staffing's low? You know, am I required to work extra or do I still get my vacation days? Is there coverage for me? So those are definitely questions you want to ask for sure. That's very important. You need time off <laughs> to breathe. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. I have a quick question. Yes, you mentioned at the beginning that there's different um, career paths in physical therapy, that you have your physical therapy assistants mm -hmm. and physical therapists, which you're a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. Today, um, the physical therapists have to get their doctorate degree. And so the PT assistant is a two-year associate's degree. And I was just wondering, like, what the contrasts are between the two in terms of salary and workload. And if you had to do it all over again, which you would do, the doctorate in physical therapy or the PTA? Um, well, it all depends on your situation. Um, so physical therapy, um, it is a longer program um, and there is more involved. Now I can't 100% speak for what is involved in school right now because I'm, I haven't been in school in like 20 years. I graduated in 2000. Um, so schools have changed, requirements have changed, but I know, you know, there's the main difference. So a physical therapist is the first person that the, the patient sees. They do the evaluation, they develop the plan of care and goals, and they determine the frequency and duration a patient's going to be seen. The physical therapy assistant then takes that. Okay, let me go back. So the physical therapist also kind of develops a checklist of, okay, I want gait training done. I want transfer training done. I want manual therapy, A, B, C, D. And then the physical therapy assistant takes that and treats the patient with those um, interventions that the therapist kind of outlined and then tries to achieve the goals that the therapist has developed as well. Now, every 30 days, the physical therapist has to see that patient again to make sure that the PTA is following that plan of care and the patient is kind of um, progressing towards those goals. Um, the physical therapy assistant does daily documentation, and I think it also depends on states, the, what states require. Um, some physical therapy assistants can do the discharge summary. Some cannot. Just depends on the practice act of that state. Um, school, like I said, schooling is longer for the PT versus the PTA. Um, salary, there is a difference. <laughs> um, but two, the school pay is different. So it's almost like, depending on where you go to school, so the PT school is quite pricey, and you may have student loans that if you were to go to a PTA school, it may balance out where you're at. I know for me, it probably did. Um, I have fortunately in the last year paid off my student loan. So <laughs> that's been a thrill, but 20 years, 21 years later, I, you know, I was in paying off student loans. So that's something you may want to consider too. Um, the salary versus, you know, your student loan debt. <laughs> um, Paperwork, I think the PTAs have less paperwork. I go to a lot of meetings, um, 
a lot of things are put on top of me, um, but the PTA is responsible as well. We're a team. Um, I have the utmost respect for PTAs. I feel like they're my equal where I just, you know, the only difference is I do the evaluations and I develop the plan of care. Um, and I feel like any team member, especially even rehab techs, um, we're all a team and we work together for the same goal is to get the patients better. Um, but that's just something to consider too, you know, the cost of the schooling and what you're going to be making. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't know the starting salaries right now. Um, I know that's kind of, it's something you could look up online. Um, I know that's, they definitely tell us not to discuss salaries to other therapists, you know, just out of <laughs> courtesy, you don't want to make someone, well, why are they making the same amount or more money than I am and blah, blah, blah. So, um, but you, PTs do make more money. I will say that. Um, um, so there is a salary difference. Um, just different things to look and weigh out your pros and cons. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, we have time for one more question. Does anybody else have another question? This is a quick question. Which school district do you work for? Uh, uh, Betty, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I work for the Fort Mill School District and they are a, an amazing district. They're very supportive. Um, our special settings um, program is amazing. Um, the staff is amazing. It's just an amazing school district. Okay, thanks. I was just curious. Uh, yeah. I agree. As a parent of a special needs child, um, I'm very happy with all of the wonderful teachers and staff that work with my daughter. They really I'm are. I'm sorry. All I didn't excellent. hear that. Can you say that one more time? Um, Willie, can you repeat that? <laughs> oh. Willie, did you have a question? No? Okay, are there any other questions before we end? All right, well, if you will join me in thanking our speaker by um, giving her a big clap with your reactions. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me. I hope I answered some questions and kind of gave you a little bit of background to maybe help guide you in a physical therapy direction. It's a wonderful field. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.